morning, Fort Collins Christian Church. You know, we're currently going through a study of the book of 1 Peter and the theme, Refined by Fire. A fire might sound good right now to those of us in Colorado as we're in this deep polar freeze. It's supposed to be like minus 16 degrees tonight. So public service announcement, keep that water dripping in those faucets so your pipes don't freeze. But that's not the kind of fire we're talking about, actually. First Peter speaks of a refining fire, not a warming fire. You know, last week we touched on how difficult the circumstances were for the original recipients of this letter, and we keyed in on Peter's reminders of who we are and why our faith needs to be refined. And so for this week's lesson, as we continue through First Peter, I've entitled the lesson, Does It Matter How I Live? You know, have you ever asked that question in some realm of life? Maybe it's like a diet or exercise regimen, you know, after a week or so and not seeing any immediate results, you start wondering, does it even matter that I'm eating kale and sprouts and tofu? Uh, I'm not seeing the results I want. I might as well just go back to eating five guys and cold stone, you know, or maybe in a little bit more serious area of life like marriage. Maybe there's things you've been working on, and, but just not seeing noticeable change in your marriage. So you, you start to wonder, does, it, does what I'm doing here even matter? Maybe it's with school. Like, man, I study and I study and I'm still getting C's. So why should I even study anymore? Let's just go back to playing video games. My guess is that most of us in some area of life have asked a question like this at times. You know, when it comes to our spiritual lives, though, have we ever asked this question? Have we ever wondered if putting Jesus first, if striving to follow him wholeheartedly even really matters? I wonder if the original recipients of this letter wondered that. I mean, the reward they were getting for their faithfulness to Jesus was the threat of death. I know I've wondered this more than once in my life spiritually. To be honest, I even at moments this week had these kind of thoughts. You know, this type of question can come about in a couple of different ways. Maybe we're trying really hard and things just don't seem to be going well. So it's more of a defeated tone that we ask this question, man, does it even matter what I do? Whereas there can be other times where we're just flat in sin and we're trying to justify it. So it's more of justified tone of, well, does it really even matter? I mean, God's grace is so amazing anyway. With more sin comes more grace, right? Well, no, that's a false teaching. Um, And so what the Holy Spirit, though, says, has to say through Peter in the section we're going to look at today, answers emphatically that, yes, it does matter how we live. And we're going to look at four specific areas this text talks about this morning. The first one of those, let's dive right in, is that it matters to God how we live. Let's go ahead and look at verses 13 through 21 of 1 Peter 1. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you, when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. You know, as we saw last week, Peter had just spent time reminding them that they were receiving the goal of their faith, which was eternal glory when Jesus Christ comes back. Okay, well, eternity, that that realm is going to happen. What about right now? And here in verses 13 through 16, we see that they were told that, but while you're still here looking forward to eternal glory, there's to be an obedience to God 
here in this life. And this is an obedience that results from a gratitude for the grace we receive through Jesus. In other words, he's, he, he focuses, yeah, here's what you need to do. You need to be holy, but it's more about who you're doing it for. For Jesus, that lamb who was sacrificed for you. And I know for me, I can get messed up when it just becomes about what I'm supposed to do and forget who I'm doing it for. You know, he says here, be holy because I am holy. And that's a quote from a Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 through 45. And the context of that original statement back then was this. It was God saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Therefore, be holy as I am holy. See, the Israelites had been rescued by God as they were brought up out of Egypt. And therefore, their lives were, be, were to be devoted to him. And so here in verses 18 and 19, we're told and reminded that we've been rescued by God. So we are to be devoted to him. And he says we're rescued by the precious blood of Jesus. Precious blood. Is his blood precious to us? You know, whether this is good or bad, when I hear the word precious, I, I think of Lord of the Rings and Gollum and the way he viewed the ring. He called it my precious. He says, you know, we wants it. We needs it. We must have the precious. And you know, that's how the blood of Jesus is for us. We must have his precious blood to live the lives we were created to live. See, I'm not sure we grasp how holy God really is. I mean, even with just one blemish, we have absolutely no right to even look toward him. But the precious blood of Jesus gives us the ability to not just look toward him, but to approach him, to approach his throne of grace with confidence, as Hebrews 4 tells us. So why does this passage in 1 Peter tell us to live as strangers here in reverent fear if we have a throne of grace that we can approach with confidence? Well, it's because the fear spoken of here is not a fear of judgment. It is a reverent fear that understands the privilege that it is to approach a holy God. You know, for example, when I worked, I worked at Target as a, a teenager and I stole while I worked there. And one day I got busted for the things I had been stealing from them. And as I was called in the security office and I'm sitting there, I sat there in fear of judgment as they showed video clips of me taking things that they had, had been videotaping me doing. And I sat there in fear of, man, I, I might be walking out of here in handcuffs and going to jail. So I cooperated with them. And when they were done with me, they actually let me go. I, I didn't walk out in handcuffs. I walked out to my car. Now, I had to pay them back for everything that I had taken, but I walked out of there free. And in that situation, I learned reverent fear. Okay, how do I know I learned reverent fear? Because I never stole again. I became a Christian several years later. So of course, as a Christian, you hope I wouldn't do that. But even in those intervening years, I never stole again. So it means I didn't walk out of there and go, oh, well, they let me go. I might as well go steal some more. No, I learned reverent fear. Well, you know what? That same type of phenomenon happened to me when I really met God, Jesus. You know, with God, the time came where I was presented with his word and I was busted. All my sins laid out the ways I'd rebelled against him. And I had fear of judgment. And yet, as I saw Jesus on the cross, the life that he gave, the blood that he gave to redeem me and was called to repentance and baptism and then received the promised forgiveness of sins as I went in those waters of baptism, I was set free by the precious blood of Jesus. So the question is, does that now produce a reverent fear in me and respect for God, the Father that says, I will not live the way I was living before you set me free by the blood of your son. Or was that type of response just for human authority that I faced 
in my situation at Target. See, he tells us here in 14, verses 14 and 15, as he talks about the precious blood of Jesus redeeming us from this empty way of life, he's basically saying, don't mess with that stuff that I rescued you from. I mean, can we really just live like the world in view of the great price that God has paid for our redemption? You know, when we start to wonder if how we live on a daily basis really matters as disciple of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, we need to remember that how we live matters to God so much that he sent his son to shed his precious blood, not only to provide forgiveness, but to produce holiness in our lives, to redeem us from that empty way of life that so many before us have lived and so many around us right now are living and that we were living before Jesus' precious blood saved us. You know, the second thing we see in this text about does it matter how I live is that, yes, it matters to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go and keep reading in verse 22 of 1 Peter 1. It says, now that, you've been puri- now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Spirit through Peter tells us that since we've been saved through the precious blood of Jesus, We are to love each other deeply from the heart. This is more than just being friendly or cordial with each other. We're to invest in each other's spiritual health. I mean, in this passage, Jesus is referred to as a living stone. I'll address that more in detail in our last point. But for now, in verse 5, this passage tells us that as his followers, it says you, and that you is plural in this text. So if like being from the South, all y'all, you know, all y'all like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. I mean, think about if you had a brick in your hand right now, what could you build with that brick? Not much. I mean, it might be useful. You could use it as a paperweight or maybe a doorstop, but you're not building anything with it. But what if you take a whole bunch of bricks together? There are amazing things that can be built with many, many bricks. And this passage tells us that we are living stones, not to be individual stones used as a doorstop, but stones that are built up together with other stones, all in the likeness of the living stone, Jesus. Well, since none of us are Jesus, that means some refining by fire needs to take place. I mean, why in the middle of this section of him talking about loving one another deeply and being built up together into a spiritual house, do we find verse one where the Holy Spirit tells us to get rid of malice, get rid of deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander? Well, the simple response is because those are sinful and we were just told to be holy as he's holy. And that's true. But specifically, the sins mentioned here are relational sins. I mean, these are things that are obstacles to us being built up together. See, the body of Christ is beautiful, but the body of Christ is made up of sinful people. Now, forgiven sinful people, but sinful people nonetheless. Every one of us has been sinned against by others in the body of Christ, and has sinned against other people in the body of Christ. It doesn't make it okay. I mean, we just talked about being holy as he is holy, but I'm just stating reality. And my bet is that those who've been Christians the longest are the ones who have been hurt the most by other 
Christians in the body of Christ, simply because over time there's been more interactions with more people. I know I have been sinned against and I've sinned against others. I've been neglected. I've been treated harshly. I've been slandered before. But that's why he tells us here that in light of the mercy that we've been shown through the precious blood of Jesus, we're to love one another deeply from the heart because the temptation where we sin against each other is to not work together anymore. To just go, you know what? This is too tiring. You know what? I know what I'm doing, so I'll just work on my part of the wall. You work on your part of the wall. But you know what? Deep love doesn't do that. Deep love admits where we've wronged others, apologizes, repents. And on the flip side, deep love forgives those who have sinned against us. Jesus knew this was going to happen. He knew the people he was calling to be a part of the body of Christ. So Matthew 18 is all about this. The whole chapter he, he talks about if someone sins against you, go to them one-on-one. Let them know they've sinned against you. And the goal of that is so that they can repent. But then you need to also forgive. So Peter asked him right after that, well, how many times should I forgive, Lord? Seven times? And Jesus goes, no, I tell you 70 times, seven times as he communicates the heart of forbearance and the heart of long suffering that our father in heaven has and that we're called to have with each other. And then he tells a parable right after that that explains the reason for doing this by reminding us of how merciful and long suffering our father in heaven is with us. That's a great Bible study. Go read through Matthew 18. You know, God did not design us to live the Christian life alone. He designed the Christian life to be lived with other forgiven yet sinful people. And he refines us to be more like the living stone Jesus as we navigate through these relationships. There's not much that can be built as an isolated solo Christian, but together God can impact the world through his church which leads to our third point this morning. Does it matter how I live? Yes, it matters to the lost world. You know, let's go ahead and read chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. It says, But you are a chosen people, speaking to his church. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. As we saw in last week's text in last week's lesson, and he mentions here again, we are chosen by God. We are special to him. This morning's text has shown us that we are a holy nation. And here we see that all of this is for a reason, that we may declare his praises, that we may be testimonies to his mercy. So he says, abstain from sinful desires that don't represent who he is. He says, live lives that will represent him well to the world in which we live and do it in order to draw others to his majesty. You know, this takes us remembering that our lives represent someone besides ourselves. Our lives represent him. We are ambassadors of Christ. Well, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone appointed by the leader of their country to represent their country in a foreign land. Well, who appointed us? Jesus. Whose kingdom do we represent? Jesus' kingdom, and we do it in a foreign land. So we're called to live as strangers here in this foreign land with reverent fear. We can't just blend in to the world. We, as followers of Jesus, should be living so differently than the world that people take notice. That was 
in point one, be holy as he is holy, but also we should be living in a way that's so loving that he is attractive to people. That was the second point about loving deeply from the heart. You know, in our lives, is there an alarm towards sin or are we quick to excuse it away or justify it for whatever reason? And that's whether it's blatant stuff like sexual impurity or more subtle stuff like just not being devoted to one another in brotherly love. It could be materialism. It could be pride. It could be idolatry, deceit, anything that is not honoring to God. Because when we stop living a life that accurately represents him, we'll stop calling others to as well. Or if we call others to, it'll be done out of hypocrisy. It's still not representing him well. So then sin gets excused and people are not pointed toward Jesus. We've got to understand that when we claim to be followers of Jesus, how we live matters. I mean, think about it. In your life, in my life, I know how other people have lived mattered to us when we were lost. I know for me, I was lost. I was seeking and a guy comes up to me on UNLV's campus and reaches out to me, offers to get together, study the Bible, and ultimately shared the gospel with me. And I was baptized about three weeks after that first meeting of us. But I found out later that he was actually struggling in his faith during the weeks leading up to our encounter. And the night before he reached out to me, he had listened to a sermon called The Harvest of the Earth is Ripe from John chapter 4. And, and in that sermon, he just uh, came to the conviction from the scriptures that, man, there are people out there who need Jesus and they're ready to know Jesus. So he had decided the next day I'm going up on UNLV's campus from eight to five. I'm just going to reach out to everyone I come in contact with to try to share with them. It was about 2.45 in the afternoon. So about what, almost seven hours after he started doing this, that he walked up to me. It mattered to me that he fought for his faith and that he responded to the words of Jesus about the harvest of the earth being ripe. It mattered. God used him as an ambassador of his son to impact my life. And we all have stories like this. You know, 1 Peter 3, we'll look at this actually a little bit more next week. We're told that it, how we live matters to our spouses, those of us who are married. You know, it matters, those of us who are parents, how we live matters to our children. I mean, we're examples to them of what it means to be devoted to Christ. So when our kids get old enough and start seeking themselves and start studying God's words to, to know him, are they going to be shocked at what they see because mom and dad didn't live that way? Or are they going to see that, man, this is really what my parents have been striving after and now I'm seeing it myself? And I'm not suggesting we can make decisions of faith for them. We can't. But we can create an environment of faith, an environment of obedience to Jesus, an environment of love for God and an expression of his love and his grace in our lives. You know, how we live matters to our neighbors. It matters to our classmates. It matters to our coworkers. See, people might look like their lives are together. I know I looked like my life was together but people need Jesus. How we live matters to others because we are ambassadors for Jesus. Lastly, we'll see in this text that how you live matters to you. How I live matters to me. Let's go back to verse one of chapter two. Uh, reread that along with a few more verses. You know, first Peter chapter two, verses one through eight says, therefore, Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, 
But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. You know, the sins mentioned here in chapter 2, verse 1 that I spoke about earlier, they don't just affect our relationships with each other in the body of Christ, and they don't just affect our witness to the lost world. These things affect our own intimacy with the Father in heaven, and that's not what he wants. He wants us to grow up in our salvation, he says. He wants us to experience that the Lord tastes good. I mean, think about that food you just crave that tastes good, and then ask him, I craving time with Jesus. He is the only nourishment for our souls. And how you live matters to you because it affects your intimacy with God. You know, here in verse 6, that word precious is used again as we're told Jesus is the chosen and precious cornerstone. Everything in life centers around our response to him. And we're told here there's only two responses. We can reject and disobey him. And it says here that the person who does that will fall. And it's a shame because they will stumble while truth and security in Christ are so readily available. And he says that, though, is the destiny of the one who rejects Jesus. But there's a second option. We can believe and obey. And to the person who does that, it says Jesus is precious. And he says that those people who believe and obey, it says, like living stones, they will be built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. And they're acceptable and pleasing to God because God clothes them with his righteousness through Christ. You know, what beautiful clothing. That is. You know, I want to share a story before we take the Lord's Supper together about a man named Richard Wormbrand. He was a minister who spent 14 years being tortured in communist prisons for smuggling Bibles into communist countries during the Cold War. You know, after getting out of prison, he was asked which Bible verses helped and strengthened him during those circumstances uh, because he didn't have a Bible with him during that, obviously. And he said, Bible verses alone are not what helped. He said, we knew Psalm 23 by heart. He says, but when you pass through suffering, you realize it was never meant by God that Psalm 23, the words themselves, should strengthen you. It's the Lord, the shepherd that the psalm speaks of that can strengthen you, not just the words that say he will. He said, it's not enough to just know the psalm. We need to know the shepherd of whom the psalm speaks. Now, clearly, this man was not diminishing the importance nor the validity of the scriptures. I remember, he was in prison for smuggling Bibles into communist nations. He clearly believed in the importance and the validity of scripture. But the point he's making is that the God we read about in the scriptures is also the God we must walk with. And it seems to me, the more I read about people who've suffered in extreme ways, not the first world type of suffering that I can typically face, uh, it seems that for them, the more uh, I read about them, it seems they gained a better understanding through this suffering of the reality importance of Jesus's suffering, of the need for comfort and refuge from God alone. In other words, I see that their whole view of God was refined during these times. And you know those things, the comfort of God, the refuge of God, I know they're spoken of in the scriptures and I grasp them intellectually. But the reality of living them daily, frankly, is a challenge at times for me in the mostly comfortable life that I live. And so my prayer is that we will cherish our intimacy with Jesus, so that we don't just know the words written on a page, but we will know the shepherd himself better than we ever have. 
It matters to you how you live. It matters to me how I live. So may we never allow things that damage our intimacy with Jesus to flourish in our lives. You know, when we find ourselves getting in the mode of wondering, does it matter how I live? Let's remember the things that the Holy Spirit said through Peter here this morning. First off, it matters to God. He gave his one and only son to redeem me, to redeem you from an empty way of life, and then to call us to a life of holiness. It matters to our brothers and sisters in Christ. God intends to use us together in what he builds to impact this world as his church. Thirdly, it matters to a lost world. I'm his child. You're his child. We are fellow workers. We are ambassadors left here to represent him on this earth. And then fourth, as we just saw, it matters to you how you live. So don't allow things that damage your intimacy with Jesus to flourish in your life, but rather may we experience how good a relationship with God tastes.